In the previous segment, we learned that Einstein proposed this idea for the principle of relativity, and that is that all the laws of physics are the same in all inertial reference frames. Recall that an inertial reference frame is a reference frame that is not accelerating. Electric and magnetic theory of the 1800s predicted that light should travel at 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Einstein proposed that light travels at that speed in all inertial reference frames. Let's try a quick example. Race rocket driver Susie is headed down the final straightaway, approaching the finish line at 1.8 meters per second. Her fans at the finish line straight ahead are shooting laser beams towards her. The speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. How fast are the light waves approaching Susie in, are approaching in Susie's reference frames? Well, why don't you try it out? Here I've drawn a lovely picture. If light waves acted like sound waves, we would get 4 times 10 to the 8th, wouldn't we? We don't. They don't act like sound waves. Susie and her fans measure the exact same speed, 3 times 10 to the 8th. Again, this is the principle of relativity. Everybody measures the same value for the speed of light. Let's see what that means. So here we see a, 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 a thought experiment. We've got Amy, Kathy, and Bill. We've got Kathy riding her bike. She's been working out. She can now ride at 90% of the speed of light. And so we're going to see this notation quite a bit in this chapter, 0.9c. So we're letting c be the speed of light, which means that 0.9c means that Kathy is riding her bicycle at 90% of the speed of light. She's very fast. Amy is shining a flashlight behind her, and Bill is shining a light towards her. Kathy measures the speed of light as those light beams arrive at her. What does she get? Well, according to the math we've done so far, she should measure, if Einstein was not right, she should measure 1.9c for this light beam traveling towards her, and she should measure 0.1c for this light beam moving towards her here. Why? Because we know for sure that the light leaves Amy and Bill at the speed of light. So if Einstein was wrong, we should get 1.9c and 0.1c. We don't. Guess what? Kathy, as well as riding her bike incredibly fast, she also have a, has a speed of light ometer, which she can use to measure the speed at which these light waves are approaching her. And guess what? All three of these people measure the exact same value for the speed of light. Kathy says, oh, I know, that light is coming towards me at C. Kathy says, oh, I know, the light from Amy is coming towards me at C. But Amy thinks it's leaving her at C. It's super, super weird. And we can do experiments on this. This is reality, right? Um, mesons are, are a tiny little particle that, that physicists study all the time. Um, in the laboratory reference frame, we see that the meson is, 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 is traveling at 0.999975c, very close to the speed of light. And if this meson emits a photon, which can happen as it decays into something else, it can emit a photon. And again, if Galilean relativity was the way that the world worked, then in the laboratory, I should measure 1.99975c for the speed of light of this photon in the laboratory reference frame. But guess what? We don't. We measure it at C. It's so strange, right? It should be going twice the speed of light if Galilean relativity was true, almost twice the speed of light. But it isn't. It's just going the speed of light according to the meson and according to the experimenter in the laboratory reference frame. This has some extremely, extremely surprising consequences. Maybe you're not surprised yet. Maybe so far you're just like, okay, I guess so. Fine. Let's see about some conclusions here. Let's imagine now this situation. Now we have Laura, Dan, and Eric. Laura, Dan, and Eric. Laura is at rest in the S reference frame. Dan and Eric are moving together in the 
S prime reference frame. This light ray passes Dan on its way to Eric. All three of these people agree on that fact. All three of them agree that the light ray passes Dan and heads to Eric. We could set up a series of experiments to prove that they all agree on that, but they do. They all agree that the light ray passes Dan and heads to Eric. Okay, uh, what else do they agree on? Well, they all agree that the light ray is traveling at the speed of light C, right? They all agree on that. What they disagree on, though, is how far the light ray traveled, right? Dan and Eric think that the light ray traveled this far, delta x prime. Dan and Eric think the light ray traveled delta x prime, whereas Laura thinks that the light ray traveled from here all the way to here. So Laura thinks that the light ray traveled this far. I mean, they're both right. Neither one of them is wrong. And I know, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, well, he, Laura's right. These guys are just moving. That's why they think that. But Dan was over here when he, when he, when, when the light ray passed him. He wasn't right here. Hmm. But you're stuck in Laura's reference frame, right? Again, you're moving at 700 miles per hour. So, so, you know, I'm, I'm holding, I'm moving at 700 miles per hour relative to the center of the Earth. I'm holding this piece of chalk. Is it wrong to say it's stationary? No, it's stationary according to me, right? And if I move it from here to here, it's perfectly reasonable to say I just moved that piece of chalk two feet. I know that because the Earth is rotating relative to the center of the Earth, I actually moved it, you know, two feet plus however far we've moved in the last two minutes, you know, 30 miles, right? So really, the piece of chalk has moved two feet plus 30 miles, and that's not even counting the fact that the Earth is moving around the sun. So which one of those is right? You know what? We can all be right. So if you believe me when I tell you that moving the piece of chalk from here to here is moving the piece of chalk 1.5 feet, then you have to believe Dan when he tells you that this light ray traveled delta x prime. And we similarly need to just believe Laura when she told me that the light ray traveled delta x. Here's the tricky thing. All three of these people agree that the light ray is traveling at the speed of light. And so they all agree on delta x over delta t. That's how we measure velocity, right? It's how far it traveled and how long it took to get there. We agree, all three observers agree that delta x over delta t is the speed of light. You can see here that if these two things are equal, since delta x prime is different, delta t prime must be different as well. And so now we've stumbled on to what we call time dilation. And this is what I referred to at the beginning of this, this lecture when I said that that YouTube cat video is a different length depending on whether I'm in the spaceship or on Earth. In other words, if Laura, Dan, and Eric disagree on how far the light traveled, then they also have to disagree on how long it took. There's one other little piece here that we have to get before we can jump to our first conclusion. And that is the idea of clock synchronization. Um, you know, if I'm looking at a clock over there on the wall and it says, you know, it's uh, 1025, well, doesn't that mean it was actually 1025 when the light left that clock? And if I'm extremely far away from that clock, couldn't it actually be later than 1025 when the, uh, uh, when, when the light actually reached me? So if I was far enough away, uh, the clock, I could be watching that clock and, and the light reaching me could say 1025, but really it was 1026. Right? So we have, in this section, we have to really remember that it takes time for light to travel someplace. You know, this is the idea like it takes eight and a half minutes for light to reach us from the sun. So that means I'm not seeing the sun as it is right now. I'm seeing the sun um, as it was eight and a half minutes ago. And if I got my really powerful binoculars out and I could see a clock on the sun, don't try that at home, then um, I would not be seeing the true time, right? I would be seeing... Uh, a clock that was running eight and a half minutes slow, right? So in order to synchronize a clock, we need to have two clocks that are spatially separated. I can't just get out my binoculars and go look and see what that clock says because my clock will be behind if I do that. What we need to do is we need to say, okay, well, if I have two clocks separated by say 300 meters, 
then we need to figure out how long it is going to take that light to travel from one clock to the other, and then I can synchronize my clock. We know that the speed of light is three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Another useful way to uh, phrase that is 300 meters per microsecond. That's another sort of way to wrap your brain around it. And so that means if I'm 300 meters away, then it's going to take one microsecond for a light to travel that far. So one way I could synchronize these two clocks, again, I can't just get out my binoculars and see what this says, because if I do, I will be one microsecond slow, which matters if we're talking about really sensitive experiments. So I could have this clock turn on. At the instant it turns on, it sends out a wave, a, a flash of light. This flash of light travels to this clock, which has been preset at one microsecond. Once that wave front hits this clock, then it will start going. And now I know that my clocks are truly measuring the same time. Again, one of our implied assumptions is that uh, in a, any reference frame, even spatially separated clocks are measuring the same time. In other words, they've already been synchronized. In other words, we have all of the equipment, and the equipment is of sufficient quality to do all of the measurements that we need. Okay, so now we're ready to talk about our first very surprising conclusion due to the principle of relativity. And that is that two observers will not agree on a time interval unless they are at rest with respect to each other. In other words, two people watching the same cat video will disagree on how long it is unless they are both at rest with respect to that cat video. We're going to introduce a little bit of notation here. We're going to let beta equal v over c. Recall that we're using v to describe the speed of one reference frame with respect to the other. Putting those together, we can relate the time interval in the primed reference frame to the time interval in the unprimed reference frame. You'll recall from this slide that these two time intervals have to be different. Again, the speed of light is the same. They have different, the light travels different distances. Therefore, there is a different time interval uh, between these two events according to different observers. If reference frame S prime is at rest relative to S, then notice that beta goes to zero, delta T prime equals delta T, and we measure the same time interval. Okay, that makes sense. But if beta is not zero, if this is some value, then the two observers will measure different times. This one can be a little bit tricky. It sometimes can be a little bit hard to figure out who's at rest and who's moving. That can be a little bit tricky. And so we introduce a new idea called the proper time. The proper time, it takes a little bit of thinking to wrap your brain around it, but I think you'll find that it's a very useful idea. We need to remember that the proper time is the interval between two events that occur at the same position. That is the proper time. So in this language, then, we replace the t prime with this, and we end up with delta t, delta tau, over the square root of 1 minus beta squared is equal to delta t. Notice that the proper time is the smallest time interval that anyone will measure. So the time interval measured by somebody who is at rest with respect to the two events is the smallest time that anyone will measure. Going back to the cat video, if I'm sitting there watching the cat video on my computer, the two events are cat video starts, cat video ends. If I'm sitting there watching this next to my computer, then I am in the same location when the, the event starts and when the event ends. Therefore, I measure the proper time. The proper time for my cat video is three minutes. But my friend who was on Earth, I'm in my spaceship, right? I'm watching my cat video on my spaceship. I was way over there when the cat video started, my friends are here, and now, whoosh, now I'm way over there when the cat video ended. So the person on Earth does not measure the proper time because beginning of the cat video, over there, end of cat video, over there, are not in the same location. So the person who is not measuring the proper time always measures a larger value. In the example I gave in the beginning of this chapter, uh, that person on Earth measured about seven minutes for the cat video. Okay, so this idea of proper time is very useful. Another way to say this is that a moving clock runs slowly compared to an identical clock at rest. 
And so this stretching out of time, we call it time dilation. So to see how that works, let's look at a real quick example. Um, here we've got two events. Uh, the first event is a moving clock passes a stationary clock. So this is stationary clock A and stationary clock B. Since A and B, these two clocks, are in the same reference frame, they are synchronized, they should run at the same rate. We should have no expectation that the clock on the train car will run at the same rate. So right when event one happens, which is train car passing clock A, all clocks are synchronized. They all read zero. However, at event two, which is the moving clock passes stationary clock B, we see two different time intervals. Notice that the moving clock, this clock right here, it measured a smaller time interval. It must have measured the proper time. Hmm, that's weird. The proper time is measured by an observer for whom the events happen at the same location. So imagine I am standing on this train car, and first I am here, and then I am here. Okay, so I'm standing on that train car, and I pass clock A. Where is clock A? Right there. Okay, I wait around a little while longer, I pass clock B. Where is clock B? Oh, it's right there. It's still right in front of me, right? So clock A was in front of me, now clock B is in front of me. Those two events happen in the same location. Therefore, I on the train car measure the proper time. Compare that to an observer standing right here. This observer sees, oh, train car passes my clock right there. Great, there's the train car. That's event one. Event one happens right in front of me. Now, I'm standing at clock A. Train car clock passes uh, clock B way over there. So where does event B happen if I'm standing on the ground next to clock A? Way down there. Okay, so event one and two happen at different locations if I'm standing next to one of these stationary clocks. Therefore, I should measure a greater time interval, and indeed I do. You try. Peggy passes Ryan at velocity D. Peggy and Ryan both measure the time it takes the railroad car from one end to the other to pass Ryan. The time interval Peggy measures is what? Greater than, less than, or the same as the time interval that Ryan measures. And I think you're going to do best here if you identify who measures the proper time. Well, first we have to identify what is our what are our two events. Um, so it's, it's important to recognize that these are delta t's we're talking about, delta tau. They're time intervals. And so a time interval is the time measured between two events. What are our two events here? The two events are front of railroad car passes Ryan, back of railroad car passes Ryan. Those are the two events, right? Um, let's think about those according to Peggy. Peggy is on the railroad car, and she's headed in that direction. Okay, so where do those events happen according to Peggy? Okay, the front of the railroad car passes Ryan. That happens over there in the, at the front of the railroad car. I'm Peggy. I'm on the railroad car. And now the back of the railroad car passes Ryan. Ooh, that happened over there, right? Because now that's the back of the railroad car, which is over there. Okay, so Peggy does not measure the proper time. Does Ryan? Let's see. Ryan is standing on the ground. The two events are front of car passes Ryan. Where does that happen? Right there in front of me. I just saw the front go by, okay? Um, and now I'm Ryan. The back of the car goes by. Right there. Oh, both events happen in the same location. Ryan, therefore, is measuring the proper time. Therefore, Ryan measures the shortest time interval because the proper time is the shortest time interval than, that anyone will measure. So Ryan measures the proper time. Therefore, Peggy, the time interval that Peggy measures must be greater than the time interval for Ryan because Ryan measures the proper time. A little bit tricky. Let's do a quick example. Saturn is 1.43 times 10 to the 12th meters from the sun. A rocket travels along a line from Saturn, from the sun to Saturn at a constant velocity of exactly 0.9 C relative to the solar system. How long does the journey take as measured by an experimenter on Earth and as measured by an experimenter on the rocket? Okay, well, here's my picture. Uh, we've got my rocket ship going from the sun over there to Saturn. Let's figure out 
Well, let's see. Let's look at the numbers again. They gave us, this is 1.43 times 10 to the 12th meters. Um, and this is the speed. And this is all relative to the solar system, right? So let's go ahead and do this calculation for how long it takes relative to the solar system. So that would be as measured by an experimenter on Earth. So according to someone on Earth, we have... Time equals distance divided by velocity. And so this is just 1.43 times 10 to the 12th meters. And we're going 0.9 times the speed of light. So this is 0 0.9 times 3 times 10 to the 8. And we run our calculator. And we get 5,200. 96 seconds. Oh, that's about an hour and a half. About an hour and a half. Okay, so this is going pretty fast. To be clear, humans do not have any spaceships that can do this. Okay. How about as measured by an astronaut on the spaceship? Well, we're going to use this, ex uh, this ex uh, we're going to use this equation right here that delta t equals delta tau divided by the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. But who measures the proper time? Why don't you try and figure that out? Just get, just maybe pause the video and, and get, give yourself a second. Who measures the proper time? Is it the person on the spaceship or the person on Earth? Well, we should be deciding who, for whom do the two events happen in the same location? Well, what are our two events? The two events are spaceship leaves the sun, spaceship arrives at Saturn. Those are our two events. For whom does that happen in the same location? Well, according to someone on Earth, Earth's right, let's say Earth's right here. There's Earth, okay? Earth. Okay, so Earth is right there. Uh, according to him, right? Event number one, spaceship leaves Earth, happens over there. And spaceship arrives at Saturn, happens over there. Oh, so the experimenter on Earth does not measure the proper time. Does someone on the spaceship? You bet, I'm on my spaceship. I left the sun. Where did that happen? Right there. Wait around a little while. Now I'm at Saturn. Oh, where did that event happen? Right here. So the proper time is measured by the spaceship. So the spaceship measures proper time. Therefore, we need to solve this for the proper time. So we end up with delta tau equals delta t times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And I'm going to get rid of Saturn here. So I have a little more room for algebra. Well, we know that delta t was about 1.5 hours times the square root of 1 minus. And you know what we don't want to do here? We don't want to calculate this out, right, for our v. Why? Because you're going to see that this happens all the time. Our c's cancel. And so we never even have to plug in are 3 times 10 to the 8th into our calculator. And so we run our calculator and we get 0 0.64 hours. So it takes much less time according to an observer on the spaceship than it does according to an observer on Earth. Who is correct? They both are. That's what's so weird is that they're actually both correct. Why should we believe this? This seems so counterintuitive, so contrary to our common sense. Well, scientists use it all the time. Right? Some of the earliest experimental evidence. Um, in 1971, uh, they had the people, scientists had developed the first atomic clocks. And I'm not talking about the uh, 
the clock on your kitchen wall made by Timex that says atomic clock on it. That clock actually communicates with the atomic clock in Boulder at NIST uh, in order to always have an accurate time, a pretty accurate time. The actual atomic clock that it communicates with is in NIST and uh, in Boulder at the National Institutes of Science and Technology. They have a very sophisticated one. But you know what? There's actually fairly small ones that keep time extremely, extremely well. In 1971, they had atomic clocks finally that were small enough that they were, you know, semi-portable. And so they actually sent this clock around the world on a jet plane while an identical clock sat in the laboratory. And these atomic clocks are, are accurate enough that they can measure time intervals in the nanosecond range. And so they, they booked a bunch of flights all the way around the, the, the world, and, and the, the flight would, would land, and the scientist would get off. He would hand it off to another uh, scientist who would get on a different flight and take it on the next leg. And uh, they found that when they came back, the moving clock was actually 60 nanoseconds behind the laboratory clock. It's pretty surprising. It's really experimental evidence that that reinforces this idea. I guess it's it's evidence in support of this idea. More evidence comes from the decay of unstable particles. Uh, one particle that scientists have studied quite a lot are muons, and so muons actually are formed at the at the top of our atmosphere uh, by collisions with these high energy cosmic rays that are streaming in from outer space. I've mentioned them uh, in some of these other lectures. These high energy cosmic rays are streaming in from outer space. They have collisions with the particles in our atmosphere and they create these muons. So these muons get created in our upper atmosphere and then they travel down towards the Earth. In the laboratory, muons are well studied. They have a half-life of 1.5 microseconds. Well, we haven't gotten to nuclear physics quite yet, but maybe you've run into this idea in another class. The half-life is how long it takes for half of a sample to decay. So if I've got 100 muons, then 1.5 microseconds later, I've only got 50 muons. Another 1.5 microseconds after that, I've only got 25 muons, and so on. This is in the laboratory. Well studied, 1.5 microseconds, a very small amount of time. However, if you actually calculate how long it takes the muons to travel from where they're created in the upper atmosphere, how long it would take them to travel down to the ground, it's about 200 microseconds. And so notice that 200 microseconds is many, many times uh, the half-life of, of a muon, right? Notice that 200 microseconds is something like 130 half-lives. So after 130 half-lives, how much of a sample do you have left? Basically nothing. Only one out of every 10 to the 40th muon. So I'd have to write 40 zeros here uh, with a one over that in, in, in order to, 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 to write that ratio of how many of these muons make it to the, to the ground. So essentially zero, right? One out of every 10 to the 40th is, is, is essentially zero. Instead, we detect one out of every 10. Why? Because these muons are moving very quickly. And in their reference frame, the half-life is 1.5 microseconds. However, in the Earth's reference frame, that half-life must be much closer to 200 microseconds. Notice we don't see half of them reach the ground, so it must be less than 200 microseconds, but still much greater than 1.5 microseconds. So we actually detect a whole lot of muons hitting the ground instead of essentially zero. And when you figure out how many you should get using the calculations for time dilation, it works out perfectly. So again, it's more experimental evidence that what I'm talking about here is not just a bunch of BS that somebody made up and now we all believe. Like, it seems to be that this is really how the world works, as surprising as it is. Here's a little schematic. Um, in a half-life of 1.5 microseconds, so in the laboratory, uh, we would expect this to only move 4.5 meters. However, because the muon is moving very quickly, in his reference frame, his clock moves slower. So according to the muon, it's still 1.5 microseconds. Let's be clear. It's just, according to somebody standing on the ground, it's 200 microseconds. It's pretty surprising.
So we've got George and Helen, they're twins. On their 25th birthday, Helen departs on a starship voyage at a speed of 0.95c to a star 9.5 light years away from Earth. And then she realizes that she actually forgot her phone and she had to go back and get it. So she immediately returns to go get her phone. We're going to neglect the amount of time it takes for her to turn around and assume that she's able to just slow down and turn around instantaneously. That's what we're going to do. Okay. Question is, how old are the twins when Helen returns? Well, let's look at this from George's perspective. He stayed home. Let's look at it from George's perspective. And I guess before we do that, we're introducing a new unit here, and this is the light year. It sounds like a light year should be a unit of time. It is not. A unit, light year is a unit of distance. And one light year is how far light travels in one year. So light travels one light year in one year. Therefore, we could light, write the speed of light as one light year per year. So depending on the situation, we could write the speed of light. We've now talked about three kind of ways, units we could use, right? It's three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. That's using our standard SI units. But we can also call it 300 meters per microsecond. That's pretty useful often. One light year per year is a nice way of writing it because I'm pretty good at my one multiplication table. So using C as long, one light year per year, let's figure out how long it is going to take for, according to George. So how long does this trip take, according to George? Uh, let's find the one-way trip time, and then we'll multiply it by two. We've got time equals distance divided by velocity. Our distance is 9.5 light years, and our velocity is 0 0.95 light years per year. Our light years cancel, and we're left with 10 years. So that's for the one-way trip. Okay, so the one-way trip takes 10 years, according to George. Uh, we're going to multiply that by 2 and get 20 years. How about according to Helen? Who measures the proper time, George or Helen? Hopefully you said Helen, because Helen... According to Helen, these two events occur in the same location. What are the two events? Leaves Earth, arrives at distant planet. Right? According to George, leaves Earth happens right here, arrives at distant planet, happens way over there. According to Helen, leaves Earth happens here, arrives at distant planet, also happens right here. So Helen measures the proper time. We need to therefore find the proper time. So... We did this algebra in the previous problem. Helen has delta t equals delta tau, excuse me, equals delta t times the square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared. And so this equals 10 years times the square root of 1 minus 0 0.95. Again, our C squareds will cancel. We run our calculator and we get 3.1 years. If we multiply that by 2, we get a round trip of 6.4 years. So we have a round trip of 6.4 years as measured by Helen. How old are they? How old are they? Well, George is 45. Helen is, what, 31.4, 31 in a few months, 31 years old. We quit cutting halves after about age five. So Helen is 31, George is 45. Is that, is this just some trick? No, like literally they were the same age when Helen left on our trip and now they literally aren't. Like, and it's not just some game, right? It's not just a clock, right? Your heart is basically a clock, right? So George's heart has beat more times than Helen's has. George's hair is grayer than Helen's is. George is closer to death than Helen is. 
the telomeres on the ends of George's DNA are shorter than they are on Helen's. It's reality. Like, really and truly, time moves differently according to whether you're moving. Or not. So what's the paradox? Well, you could look at this and say, well, 20 just doesn't equal 6.4. That's the paradox. And no, that, that's not the paradox. There, there is no paradox there. That's just very surprising. You could tell me, though, since all motion is relative, I suppose you could tell me that it was Helen that was at rest, and that George on Earth went that way 9.5 light years, and then back 9.5 light years. I suppose you could tell me that. Is there anything wrong with that perspective? Because if we did the math from that perspective, we would find that George was younger. Is that the paradox? That's a little more subtle way of looking at it. It turns out that that's not a paradox either. There really is no paradox. I don't know why this is called the twin paradox. But this difference in the time, that is just a surprising result of the principle of relativity. As to this business of who's right, George or Helen, well, only one of these people is in an inertial reference frame. The person that is in an inertial reference frame is George. Therefore, this math is right for George. It is not correct for Helen. Helen's reference frame is not inertial, so she cannot do special relativity. She needs general relativity in order to do this calculation. And if we did this calculation using general relativity, we would find a complete agreement. So, the calculation done from George's perspective is correct. There really is no paradox. It is very surprising. But a surprising conclusion is not the same as a paradox. This, as far as we know, is actually how this bizarre universe that we live in works.